Okay, my name is Elena Castel Perez. I am a food engineer and I am a professor in the Department of Biological Agriculture Engineering. And I was asked to talk to you about how can technology make sure that we get high quality, safe food products to specific regions. And I'm going to tell you my personal experience working with the Pinot Cris project in uh, semi-arid tropic Africa. You have seen a version of this map throughout the morning and we will keep looking at that map. My question was how, first, what is the problem, right? And if you look at this map, there is a real global hunger problem. So this is nothing, not something made up by Washington Wright and trying to justify how do we spend money, how do we help people. It's a real problem. And what I noticed is that Latin America has really made a lot of progress reducing hunger since the 1990s, even though there are still some clear uh, countries with a huge problem. It's not over yet, but they have done a lot of progress. But if you go to Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, they are in trouble. And I was starting thinking, wh why is this happening, right? So yeah, you can blame political instability, conflicts, wars, natural disasters. You have the HIV, uh, AIDS rates, and all that adds to the problem. So you have really children that are dying at very high rates, and a lot of people are not getting the calorie requirements they need per day. That's a, a simple problem. So I, of course, I am an engineer, and as Ed Price talk about the hickory nuts and cracking those nuts with a hammer. My brain will start turning like crazy. And how do we make that process efficient and safe, right? So we can talk about that later. The point I want to make that there is a lot of food that is not reaching people. And is that food wasted? Is that food lost? So I start to try to understand what is really happening. So here is a microscopic view of a huge problem. So I'm going to focus on that the issue that food insecurity is partially related to those countries having inadequate technology. Technology is really making things happen, right? How to make things work and more, and more effective. So as you can see, the more developed countries have a more sophisticated, sophisticated food supply chain is obvious. And the struggling countries really deal with very rudimentary infrastructure. And what is the role of us, right, technology to make that process more effective so we can move then into the transitional countries and hopefully into a more sophisticated uh, chain. Again, I was kind of confused. Why is, okay, a lot of food is not reaching people. So is it wasted or is it lost? And if you look at that chart, that was really astounding to me. If you look at developing countries, especially the United States, a lot of the food reaches consumers, but it's really wasted from the food service to homes point. And that's a very different problem when you look at developing countries where most of the food is lost f from the production from the farm to the processing post-harvesting level and it barely reaches the consumers at a level that is high quality and is safe to eat. So this is two different uh, problems. And the point I want to make, we cannot forget that the, you know, there is hunger in the United States, right? We, there is obviously not at the same level, but there, is, there are issues here that we need to address. And I think we need to think about why is that food wasted, high quality food wasted, and those, why do we have hungry children in this country? But we are go I'm going to focus on what's happening here, right, that that food is really lost and does not reach people. And I just decided to give you some images. We have inadequate storage, insect infestation is a big problem, induces product loss. 
distribution problems, very rudimentary processing facilities, and of course, conflict as to the problem of food insecurity. So how can we, what can we do, right, using technology to help? And my experience with the CRIS programs, and Joseph mentioned the CRIS program. I didn't know anything about CRIS program until I was part of one. So I decided to give you a brief introduction. What is a CRIS pro program? Uh, CRIS stands for Collaborative Research Support Programs. These are two key words, collaborative and research. And I will go back to that soon. And they were established in 1975 to really provide a long-term mechanism so that the capabilities of land-grant universities and other universities can be put into an effort to advance, really accelerate the agricultural development in nations worldwide. There was no specific region. There are actually 10 uh, CRIS programs, and you are in curious, just go to this website and you will learn a lot. So there are actually 10 CRIS programs, and Joseph talked about one of those, the, the COWP program. My experience is with another nut, right? The Pinot Crisp. It was established in 1982 really with one single focus, how to in increase the use of peanuts in a specific areas. The focus at that time was semi-arid tropical Africa, and as you see through the development of the years, it has expanded to other countries. And they have a lot of activities going on in Latin America, Caribbean, even Eastern Europe, and the rest of uh, Africa. I'm going to talk to you about my, my experience with that pro project. Uh, peanuts were introduced to these countries by the British and the France, French, right, to satisfy the demand for vegetable oil. So the facilities in those countries were used with the only purpose to produce vegetable oil. And then they will discard the rest and maybe give it to the livestock. So once the, you know, the changes in trades and the supply, the demand was not there anymore, those, those facilities were really left up to the locals. And the, it, was the, it was designed to produce oil. What to do with the rest? So peanut is a very unutilized crop in those countries. So the, the uh, I would talk to you about so the emphasis is capacity building, post-harvest technology, the important critical aflatoxin problem, and the recent approach is to analyze every single step of the post-harvest processing chain and see where are the problems, how to fix them. So it's a more holistic approach. And of course, like Joseph, said, why peanut, right? It's obvious. Peanut is a, is a, has nitrogen fixation capability, so it can reduce the need for chemical fertilizers. I'm not a farm girl. I was, I'm, I'm a beach girl, but anyway, I was, <laughs> I used to be. But when I, I did not understand what that meant until I went to Africa, and I understood how expensive it is for that small farmer to buy fertilizer to grow their crop. This has the, the, the sustainability uh, characteristics. As you are into production, you know what I'm saying. So I learned something. Yeah, it's not easy to grow crops. But to me, the most important aspect of why peanuts is it can really address the malnutrition problem. It is high protein, high uh, uh, energy density material. So if you look back to Hillary Clinton's 1,000 days, the first 1,000 days are critical. This winning foods, this peanut is the perfect crop to do that. It's also a subsistence farming crop and is mostly uh, grown and produced by women. So this is really the main uh, source of income for them. So it's, and it's produced domestically, so it's, it has all the aspects necessary to make peanuts the right crop. The question, okay, peanuts has a lot of potential, but what can we do? Peanut products are consumed daily in 
these countries, and I went specifically to Burkina Faso and, and Ghana, but they are available only in very crude form. So you see vendors uh, roast, boil, sugar coated uh, peanuts for snacks, and the famous peanut paste, which is used mostly as an ingredient for soups and other products. So that's really very limited uh, variation of products. Also, the aflatoxin content, the safety issues ha have, were not addressed, and everything was really mainly due to inadequate technology. So we briefly, again, I will be here all day and tomorrow, can tell you more stories, but I will briefly give you some of the things we did. The thing, what can we do? How can we increase the use of this crop, right, to address the nutritional issues using technology? And again, the word research is key because these projects uh, stimulate research. And so we can make new products, improve their, their products, and enhance the post-harvest technology. So they, have, they are able to handle it, store it, distribute, process high quality, safe foods. Again, one of the main stories. This is a small local peanut paste manufacturing in Bobo de Lasso, which is a city maybe three hours from the capital of Burkina Faso, Ouagadougou. It is a, a, it is a three hours trip by car, a jeep in one of those roads. So it can be an adventure when you go there, a lot of fun. The issue is that the local peanut paste producer was going to go out of business. Why? Because their product was very, very bad quality. In addition to that, it, it also was very expensive. So peanut consumers are the low-income people most of the time. So there was a big issue. And we went there with the, uh, our host partners, and I will tell you quickly about them in a, in a moment, and look at their manufacturing, their technology, and find out that their grinding was very, very rudimentary. Peanuts had to be crushed, ground, uh, mixed, and heated to create peanut paste. The grinding uh, technology was totally outdated, and they were using some old grinders from a company that used to deal with construction materials. Totally the wrong piece of equipment, right? You know, your antennas, woo, but. I mean, that's, that's what I think you can do so much yeah. with basic technology. So we look at that and we, we learn, oh, sorry, we, inve we, we went around and we found out there were local manufacturers of equipment that provided the perfect grinders for their purpose. So you get a more uniform product. Before it was very coarse texture. People did not like the product. Pinot paste is a thinner version of the peanut butter we have. So it, you remove a, a ineffective and maximize the yields, a better product that people like better. The second problem they had, they were limited by their package. Amazingly, they, can on, they could only package the product in half a gallon metal cans that came from France. And you know, everything from France is expensive, right? So it was a very expensive container and too big. A peanut paste, look how peanut paste is, is sold. Small plastic bags and it has to be used the same day because peanut paste will become rancid very quickly. So it was a very ineffective packaging uh, system. The problem is they did not have a solution. So what we did, we helped then find a local supplier of a plastic container that has to be thickened off to withstand the high temperatures during packaging. And of course, the problem is it's transparent, so it becomes rancid with light, but you can put a nice uh, label and take care of that. So all these two aspects really help that company stay in business and provide employment and infrastructure to that area. So they gave one single example when basic knowledge of technology helps and does a lot of impact. So it was a very satisfying thing. Many other things we can do, uh, the, we can modify, uh, I need to address that 
The University of Ouagadougou was our partner. I really believe you cannot do anything by doing research only here. These people were so committed to making things happen. So you need to have that in those countries. They really want to, they are convic convinced that they, they, and they really want to. They spend a lot of time doing the analytical, sensory, um, physical uh, type of research to create new products. We provide support, but they really were the ones doing the, the hard work. So finally, uh, the variety of products that you can make enhances the use of peanut as a major source of protein. I know that the consumption of meat is increasing, but in, uh, when I went there, a lot of people, the only source of protein was through peanuts. So some people still would not have access to meat protein. So if you increase the number of food products, the consumption of peanuts will increase, more business for the women uh, producers and processors. And so it has a lot of impact at the low uh, rural and local urban markets. And again, training, training of graduate students, technicians, university professors, it changes. So huge, a multidisciplinary aspect. I also visited Ghana, which is a different uh, setup, British colonies, French colonies, uh, different, different. Uh, <laughs> I'm not French, but uh, um, again, collaborative research. So we did a lot of research in the United States, and we tried to transfer it to the host country. So we play with extrusion, and that machine, my extrusion is a simple, everybody likes pasta, right? Yeah. Yeah, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> kind of hungry. Extrusion is really a machine that you put a mixture of flour and water, high temperature, high pressure, and as it, it, it goes through a small, tiny orifice, it spans, and you can create many textures. Here you see the, the sophisticated texture of developing countries. But when we, we want, again, wonderful partner, the Food Research Institute in Accra, Ghana, we moved the instrument uh, unit there when they were able to play with our machine and develop formulations. Again, that 1,000 1, first days for winning foods to increase the percent protein in the cereal-based foods. You see, you can actually make cereal-based food with up to 63% protein. And again, a lot of work went into that, and Dr. Rios is here, the extrusion expert, and you know what happens when you put a fatty product through a extruder. It's a mess, right? So it required a lot of uh, hard work. Again, very satisfying uh, thing. Another issue in Burkina Faso, the safety aspect. And I have to say, there is a lot of work going on today in the Pinos Cris in toxicology with Tim Phillips uh, dealing with the aflatoxin problem. But it's still there. It's not gone. It's still going. And the emphasis of sorry. The emphasis is on using native natural compounds to address the issue. What they did in Burkina Faso, they discovered that garlic has a compound, allium sativum, that has inhibitory uh, properties. The, the challenge was how to apply that compound into raw peanuts, raw peanuts. It's not easy. Nobody likes to eat peanuts that taste like garlic, right? So a lot of things when they're dipping and spraying, a lot of technology and analytical work, extensive. Benefits are obvious. It's, it, they have been able to control better the, the contamination. But again, it's not over. And I keep addressing that they still need improved storage practices. If you get uh, peanuts that have been infected by insects, that's really opening them up for aflatoxin contamination. So there is still need for basic traditional technology in addition to the brand new 22nd century technology. And I want to leave you with a few things about Pinot Cris. The Pinot Cris has already put together a draft on how do they fit the Feed the Future initiatives. And it, you look at it, a five meaning very relevant, if you look, a lot of the food feature activities have a number five for the peanut crease only, 
only one of the 10 CRIS programs and anything else. So very relevant to what we want to do here. And my last slide. What did I learn? As the, Mr. Butler said this morning, you had to know the, the country. You had to know what they do, what they produce, what they like to eat, and what they need before we go there and impose our technology and tell them what to do. The, the reason I say that because uh, they try to do the same thing with soybeans, but it didn't work. People do not eat soybeans like in Africa like they do in Asia, so it did not work. So we need to know the country. The programs work. I mean, you want emphasis on technology, quality, storage, packaging. They work, so they have to be kept in case. We haven't done anything yet. That's, I agree with Elsa. It's not done. We have a lot to do. And we have to edu educate the people. The, those who are making the process, pro pros, they need to know how to ensure quality and safety. And of course, uh, we have to enhance the research capability of the health country. And of course, I, we, this is multidisciplinary. Engineers cannot do this alone. Food scientists, uh, horticulturists, entomologists, we need to get everybody together. And so I'm saying, what are we waiting for? I don't know about you, but I'm ready. I'm ready to, to get this rolling, cracking the nuts, right? And so forth. Anyway, just a few thoughts of my personal experience. I think we have the capabilities here. And let's see what comes out out of this today's. So thank you for the opportunity.